Welcome back. We're talking about the shooting attack in Munich in Germany, which has left at least nine people dead. Let's get back to our panel. And Rolf, what exactly would be going on in Germany now as far as uh, going after these attackers are concerned? Who's, there's a federal police force in Germany. Yes. Uh, would they be involved in this? They would be involved. They are very much involved. Actually, we have one crack unit, the GSG-9. It's a counterterrorism unit from the federal police. They have been brought in just hours after the attacks happened. Mm -hmm. And they are coordinating with the local police and the state police as well. They're all working together. What kind of cooperation is there between a federal force and a local police force in Germany? Because in some countries, you know, there is kind of a turf war going well, on. Well, they do have curfews, and they want to show, make sure that everybody has got its own stake. But in a situation like that, I'm pretty confident that they are cooperating. Uh, Ansgar, you mentioned earlier on that there is this widespread perception that there are a lot of terrorists who infiltrate into Europe from Syria. You know, they come as part of refugees. The Europol, uh, the European Law Enforcement Agency, plays down on that. They say they haven't found much evidence that that is the case. Yet, I mean, that persists. There is a belief that that uh, does happen. Uh, could we see Germany cut back on the number of refugees it takes because of that? Because public opinion would say, we don't want to take that many refugees if they pose a danger to us. Oh, I think this process started already a mm -hmm. month ago in uh, in March, we had this uh, agreement between European Union and Turkey to close the border of the so-called Balkan route uh, to, uh, to stop this uh, way to Europe. And uh, so the, the increase, uh, the, the, um, uh, the pouring in was diminished drastically. Last year, um, I think there were about 1.2 or 1.5 million refugees coming to Germany. Uh, this year, I think up to now, it's about 220,000 or 230,000 um, uh, people migrating to Germany. So it's uh, less than last year, but it's still a big number. And last year, we had this famous um, uh, speak of Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. our chancellor, who said, we can make it, uh, refugees welcome, and that created this welcome refugee culture in Germany. And it was uh, at the, in the very same city, Munich, where one year ago we had, uh, on any given weekend, up to 20,000 refugees coming in. And people, ordinary citizens, were cheering them and were uh, offering food and, and shelter and so on. And at this, in this moment, there started the debate. Some people thought we have this, we have to take them in, we have to give them shelter, we have to, and we can integrate them. And others said there are too many coming in a too short period of time, we can't integrate them. And um, I think uh, that was a point when, um, uh, when Angela Merkel, who was very popular and is still popular today, but for a Part of Germany, a part of Germany fell out of love with her, and s same happened to Europe. Our uh, European countries weren't very amused about this uh, this solo action of uh, Angela Merkel, who said, "We will, we have to help them. We have this obligation." And uh, then the, we, we started these uh, negotiations with Turkey, and I think the the atmosphere one year ago and today is totally different. So clearly the hospitality is drying up. Sure, yeah. Rebecca, I mean, uh, refugees coming into Europe uh, from Syria or from Iraq, I mean, that's one thing. What about uh, people referred to as returning jihadis? You know, these are Europeans, young people, who go to Syria, who go to Iraq, spend some time there mm -hmm. uh, with ISIL, and then come back. Yeah. How great a danger do they pose? Is um, it a bigger danger? Uh, well, not numerically, yeah. um, certainly. Um, there's not that many returning jihadis. We don't know precisely how many there are, of right. course. Um, but in terms of um, coming back with uh, an ideology intact and a, a lot of training, and then perhaps serving as a node for facilitation, recruiting others uh, into the network, that's certainly a possibility. Although another thing that we've seen, of course, is young men and women who go to Syria and Iraq and then uh, realize it's not what they had expected it to be and come back gratefully. But I think probably the larger number that we've seen are people who would be classed as returning jihadis. Yeah, we've heard of a number of cases where young people have gone there basically on an adventure trip, mm -hmm. not realizing what they were getting into, and they've come back. Uh, 
Joe, we were talking about the, you know, the age of the loan attack or, or very small groups. Um, how does Europe counter that? Um, and of course, the other problem that mitigates against you know, Europe getting full control of this is the fact that it has open borders, isn't it? That you can move. You can actually move. Once you set into the um, uh, most parts of Europe, the Schengen Accord, uh, namely you arrive, uh, uh, like you arrive in Athens, Greece, or Lisbon, Portugal, or, or Berlin, Germany, or Paris, France, then you can theoretically at least, because things have changed a little bit over the last period, uh, you can move all, all over the place from the uh, southern Mediterranean all the way to the northern pole within the Schengen zone with no border control, with no customs, with no, uh, nobody actually. Now, things, once again, things have changed uh, uh, over the last year, 18 months in this sense, and you do have controls uh, through a way and legislative and, and, and practical way which diverts um, uh, uh, the, the strict Schengen implications. But I think that politically also these things, behind the police level and the intelligence gathering and intelligence operations and counterterrorism, politically in terms of uh, impact on society, on the way people think and behave and go about their daily lives, this is a very powerful thing. The idea that people may enter from, let them be from Afghanistan or from Syria or from Libya uh, or from elsewhere uh, um, and then move, or even people who had been radicalized on European soil, this so-called homegrown terrorism, could move. We saw how effective and how deadly that was in the cases of two attacks in Brussels in Paris, mm -hmm. in which crossing borders play a very um, a major role in the success, so to speak, of the deadly operations. So if you just multiple that north and south, east and west, you can see what kind of uh, deadly impact it might have on heads and thoughts and mentality. And Rebecca, didn't we have a case in Paris where the identities of these uh, perpetrators of these acts were known in one country but not in the other. And of course that just goes to what Joe was saying that once they've crossed, they're in another country. Yes, and it was a cross-border terror yeah. attack. I mean, they, they drove in from Brussels to Paris for the Bataclan attack. Um, their point of origin was, was Brussels. Um, that is true. Um, and, and the internal open borders in the Schengen zone uh, do create some complications when you're talking about movement of terrorists. Although, again, I feel like I just need to, to be clear that it, when we're talking about terrorists who've committed these attacks, generally speaking, they are not people who came in as refugees. They're people who were um, either immigrants from uh, well before the refugee crisis right. or people who were born, born in Europe, yeah. raised in Europe, uh, the children of immigrants. And so it makes it even more complicated since otherwise you could uh, look for people who came within the last 12 or 20 months mm -hmm. and uh, make a surveillance mm -hmm. whether they have any uh, ki links to mm -hmm. terroristic uh, or Islamic organizations, but you have on the other side those people born and raised in European countries and they radicalize them kind of in, of themselves and that's totally complicated to get uh, them. And I think in the end it, it doesn't make a big difference whether they are sent by ISIS or just inspired by ISIS, like this guy in Nice he was mm -hmm. inspired by ISIS. That's right, this yeah. guy in, in uh, Würzburg in, in Germany last week mm -hmm. uh, who, who claimed, when he came to Germany, he claimed to be from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But now uh, we think, our law enforcement thinks, uh, he, he, he was from Pakistan and he was older than he claimed to be. He said he's uh, 17, but he was maybe uh, 20 or older. And uh, he radicalized himself. And that's, uh, it's, it's totally complicated to to get track to those guys. Rolf, the United States has adopted uh, what are seen as some very controversial policies in terms of how it counters the terrorist threat here. Yes. Uh, uh, there is surveillance by you know, domestic agencies, by the NSA, etc. cetera. Um, would you see something like that in Germany? Well, I see at least a discussion coming up, uh, especially in the light of these recent attacks. But you do have to understand that we do have a history of a surveillance state in eastern right. Germany and that's not so long ago. We know where it can go to and we know where we don't want it to lead. So the German populace still is very, well, resistant skeptical and resistant. And uh, if you talk about Edward Snowden, most people in Germany probably think he's a hero. And Rebecca, when we look at, you know, how the law uh, takes care of this in Europe, um, how successful has Europe been in prosecuting terrorists? Um, you know, um, 
I think, generally speaking, fairly successful. Um, but you know, uh, you're talking, I'm assuming, about uh, terrorists who are identified before they commit an attack, because right. because. The situation that we're dealing with now with the manhunt is really the exception rather than yes. the rule. Generally yeah. speaking, yeah. when we see a terror attack, mm -hmm. um, the terrorists are actually usually killed on site. So it's not, um, there's no opportunity to go through the justice system. Um, I think once they're able to get into the justice system um, in places like Germany, the, the, the pathways for prosecution are fairly good. When you're looking at Brussels, I think Brussels is a much more complicated situation because of the sort of very separate municipalities. It doesn't hang together the, the legal system quite in the same way that, that it does in Germany. Yeah, that's right. They have those communes in Brussels. Exactly. Yeah.